up, swashbucklers? You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 99. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host of the show. Thank you once again for tuning in. Thank you for telling your friends about the show and helping me keep the old ship afloat. I appreciate it. Episode number 99, fun fact about the number 99. This year, on August 21st, we will see the first total solar eclipse to pass over the United States in 99 years. It's coming up pretty soon, August 21st. And uh, it's going to make a trail from like uh, northern Oregon, like if you drew a diagonal line from northern Oregon to the Carolinas. Like down there. So I know there's a lot of listen, a lot of you listening in the Carolinas uh, and some of you listen up northern Oregon and all parts in between. So if you're in one of those places, you'll be able to say total solar eclipse. Wear the special glasses. Don't just stare at the sun. That's dumb. Don't do that. Uh, but when I was driving through northern Oregon doing some gigs a couple weeks ago, I noticed all the signs that were like, camp here for the eclipse. Buy your supplies here for the eclipse. Stay here for the eclipse. Please, please, please stay here for the eclipse. I think a lot of these small towns are going to make a nice, nice chunk of dough because uh, the sun is going to blot out for two and a half minutes. Uh, but good for them. Make that dough. Make that dough. Make that dough. Yes. So anyway, uh, if you aren't in one of those places and you don't want to drive to one of those places, it's going to, you'll see like, uh, the, like Wyoming and it's going through a lot of states where there's not that many people. Um, but if you don't want to drive to one of those places to see the eclipse, you don't have to wait that long because we're actually going to have another one in 2023. Another total solar eclipse in 2023 that will crisscross the opposite way of the uh, the United States because it's just it's nature just playing fair. Give everybody a shot at it, right? So that one's going to go from like Southern California up to Maine. It's going to cross the other direction. So that'll be nice. We can we can wait until 2023 if you're not in one of the areas where you can see it in August. Apparently, these solar eclipses they happen like twice a year or so. Uh, but a lot of times they happen in places where there are no people, like in the middle of the ocean, uh, where you will not see it unless you're a pirate. Ah, brought it back around to the theme of the show. Good for me. My guest on the show today is B.D. McGee of B.D. Blades. And B.D. makes uh, sharp, pointy metal things, uh, swords and knives and all sorts of cool stuff. And he makes beautiful versions of them. He does really, really fantastic work. He was the first place winner on Forged in Fire, which is a TV show. We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about what he did with the prize money and how it works and how he got into uh, bladesmithing and uh, all that kind of good stuff. It's a really fun, interesting talk, and I think you're going to dig it because uh, who doesn't like sharp, pointy metal things? Really, honestly, they're a lot of fun. I uh, Over the weekend, uh, took my girlfriend to see the new Transformers movie, which I know isn't that new. It's been out for a few weeks, but uh, the Transformers movies are an ongoing subject of debate in our house because she likes them and I have taste in movies. Um uh, <laughs> So I went and said, I've seen all of them. I've seen all of them, and they've all been bad. Uh, this one, which I think is the fourth one, is uh, by far the worst. It's it's horrendous. There are so many plot holes in this ridiculous film that I just, I had to keep my mouth shut most of the time because she gets annoyed when I talk during movies because I'm a comedian, so I riff naturally, right? Uh, this was not even riffable. I just spent most of the movie staring at the screen like, why? Why did they do that? Why did that just happen? Why did the Transformers uh, run away from the villains instead of turning into cars and drive away from the villains? Uh, just like, why is that girl there who is accomplishing nothing as a character? It was so unbelievably bad that if you have not seen the Transformers movie, uh, uh, well, look, if you like Transformers, you've already seen the movie and you hate every bit of my review uh, of this movie. But if you have not seen it and you're wondering, maybe, maybe, should I maybe go see it at the half price uh, theater when it ends up there? Or uh, shall I wait for Netflix to yeah, just don't don't please don't waste two and a half hours of your time watching this ridiculous movie? Like, I guess if you just like CGI eye candy, maybe. OK, OK. Oh, man, there's at one point in the movie, <laughs> this actually, uh, uh, I, somebody on the screenwriting team had to, did, there's one of the characters goes, do you ever feel like you're just wasting your life? And I was like, yes, right now, I'm wasting two and a half hours of my life with this. Oh, my God, it was terrible. And they said that it was going to be the last Transformers movie, and then they leave it open for another one at the end. And I thought I was going to not have to see any more of them, but uh, here's I might have to. Yeah, she likes them. <laughs> That's all right. I'll indulge her once in a while. 
I am uh, back on the road a little bit this week doing uh, doing a couple of uh, comedy gigs. If you want to come out and see me tell some jokes, uh, Monterey last weekend was super fun. Really cool, smart audience. That was so much fun. Uh, this week, Tuesday, July 11th, if you're listening to this the day it comes out, I'll be headlining at the Vintage Lounge in Turlock, California. Uh, Thursday, July the 13th, I'll be at Tesora's in Campbell, California doing a short set. Uh, that's a wine bar type of thingy. Um, I'm doing a, like, I'm only doing, I'm doing like 10 minutes that night. I'm going to go back and headline in a couple months. And then Friday, July the 14th, I'll be headlining at the Redwood Cafe in Cotati, California. And that is always a fun show up there. Cotati, weird little town. But, uh, if, if you're into that vibe, it's a, it's a fun little vibe. It's good. Uh, if you're enjoying the show and I hope that you are, we're going to get to the interview here in a second. Make sure you come over and join us on Facebook. Facebook.com slash under the crossbones, twitter.com slash under crossbones, no the in that one. And do make sure that you are subscribed to the show through um, Apple Podcasts, uh, iTunes, and they call it Apple Podcasts now. Uh, Apple, uh, Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Slacker or Google Play or any of those places, whatever you like to get your podcast through, make sure you hit that little subscribe button so you get each and every of the new episodes downloaded right to your device automatically. That's how the internet works. Everything is automatically. Except when people say automagically, which I hate. Don't don't say that. Uh, and of course, you can get all the show notes for this show at underthecrossbones.com slash zero nine nine. This is the last episode we have to use that zero on the beginning. Isn't it exciting? <laughs> yeah, episode number 100 next week. It's coming up. I got some fun stuff for you on that one. If you want to uh, help support the show as well, uh, financially in some form or fashion, that would be awesome of you. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. Right there, there's a little PayPal box that you can drop a donation into, any amount that you think is sufficient. Uh, it, there's an Amazon banner there. If you click that Amazon banner and you go buy yourself something nice at Amazon, uh, maybe uh, the Transformers movie box set, possibly. Don't do that to yourself. If you buy yourself something nice at Amazon, Amazon kicks me back a few shekels, and that is very helpful. It's nothing I'm going to retire on, but it is very helpful. And if you want to be a sponsor of the show, that is also cheap and easy. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash support, and you can uh, find a way to contact me right on that page, and we will talk about get you a sponsorship on the show. Okay, well, let's get into it, all right? We're going to talk sharp, pointy metal things, man. Swords and daggers and knives and bears. Oh, my. Here we go. This is my interview with B.D. McGee of B.D. Blades. Enjoy. I'm playing uh, Grandpa right now. Okay. <laughs> I, I uh, shoot grandkids with me, so at any given time, I may have to uh, jump up and do something real quick, but... Yeah, no problem. So you are a bladesmith, and I've had one other bladesmith on the show, and he was making uh, prop kind of blades and things like that, but you make actual sharp things, right? Uh, yes, of course. Okay, great. I, I know nothing about bladesmithing. The I think the largest thing I've ever wielded is a kitchen knife, so this will be entertaining. But first, tell me how you got into uh, bladesmithing. Well, I uh, pretty much started a, a dare for my... My wife. Uh, I I uh, gave you a little bit of history uh, about me. I used to. Uh, I, I was a former police officer okay. uh, in in New Jersey, and uh, I was a cop for twenty years. And being a police officer, you get pretty familiar with weapons. Sure. And um, you know, just uh, through the uh, three years, I got really good at uh, sharpening blades and had a real fascination with blades. So. Uh, when I retired, my wife is, uh, she's uh, retired from the, uh, judiciary and she, uh, you know, graduated, uh, uh college and, uh, law school, the whole bit. And she had a real fascination of history. Uh-huh. So we do a lot of, uh, reenacting, uh, from the 1500s all the way up to the 1800s. And okay. in that time period, there's a lot of weapons, a lot sure. of swords, a lot of knives, daggers, and so forth. And, um, she was going to purchase me a, a sword for one of her uh, outfits. And the gentleman uh, knew that I uh, shoe horses and um, asked her, why doesn't your husband make a blade? Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so she, actually, she, she uh, said, I bet you can't make a, uh, a blade or a sword out of that horseshoe right there. I'm like, well, challenge taken. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, after six hours of beating on uh, a horseshoe, uh, maybe a small blade. So um, a friend of mine in the reenacting world heard, heard that uh, I had made a, a blade for myself. And 
um, asked if I could make a, a sword for him, and uh, I just said sure. So uh, I had no response to figure things out and um, figure out how the uh, the blazer had to be a forge and so forth. So uh-huh. it just threw a lot of um, practice and breaking things and uh, <laughs> making a lot of a lot of failures. Uh, uh, I came about the, uh, you know, the the correct process and just through a lot of practice, um, I figured out the uh, the whole uh, kneeling and uh, tempering process and uh, knowing when when to uh, quench it and sharpen it and everything else. Uh, you know, it just it kind of started taking off. One one person found out that that a friend of ours. Uh, got the blade so another person said hey, let, let me have one uh-huh. so it just, uh, it just sort of t- started taking off and kind of took on a life of its own and uh, being retired I was looking for something to um, fill my time and uh, it just really uh, filled the void really nicely that's really cool so I have a couple of questions so you said you were a, a cop in New Jersey right yes which part of New Jersey uh, northern New Jersey Northern New Jersey. Okay. Uh, I only ask because yep. I have a lot of relatives in New Jersey who you probably gave tickets oh, okay. to at some point. Um, so <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I have a lot of family in Patterson and um, Hackensack oh, and places right like where, that. That's where I work. Okay, I nice. Was, uh, I was a county cop in, uh, in, in Patterson. Okay, yep. excellent. Very cool, very cool. Uh, and so what kind, you said you're doing a lot of reenacting and things like that. Uh, what is your favorite kind of reenacting to do? Uh, probably for the uh, the garrison at the uh, fort in San Augustine. Okay. You know, uh, portraying a um, a soldado, you know, a Spanish soldier. Okay, gotcha. And um, you get to uh, fire the cannons off the uh, the flintlocks, and and uh, so you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of live weapons, and um, it's just uh, it's neat to be able to shoot all those things off and <laughs> get to watch big booms come out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I like it. So when you were doing this horseshoe blade, by the way, a dare like that just sounds like a wife trying to get her husband out of the house for a while. But oh yeah, that's, <laughs> let's see. What can I make him do that would take a really long time and keep him out of my hair? That's it. It'll yeah. work. <laughs> so when you were doing this horseshoe blade, you had no equipment to speak of. You were really just out there pounding the thing old school until it was sharp, right? Yeah, pretty much. I just had the the anvil uh, from because you know, uh, we have a couple of horses, so. Uh-huh. Uh, just out of necessity, I learned how to uh, shoot the horses, uh-huh. and um, you know, it just it got very expensive having a fair amount of property to uh, shoot the horses. So, just simply out of necessity, I learned how to uh, shoot the horses, and I uh, got equipment for that. You know, a tiny little uh, forge, you know, heats up the uh, shoes. Okay, and um, a, a couple of uh, basic hammers and equipment that I needed to put the shoes on. So it was just a tiny little anvil and. Um, forge and a couple of hammers. So that's really what I started with. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so simple and kind of learning it yourself. Strangely, I learned how to build websites for the same reason. Cause I didn't want to have to keep hiring somebody to do it. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Sure. So that's a cool idea. Yeah. And, you know, we all have our own needs, I suppose. And, yeah. uh, so as you, you got into this and other people started seeing it and started asking and things like that, what yeah. is your, what's your process in kind of leveling up equipment and skill wise in that? I mean, I, it sounds like a, uh, a, maybe an expensive hobby to have. Oh, it, it's, yes, it, it's a very expensive hobby. You know, it, um, you know, of course the, uh, the more equipment you get, the more expensive it gets. Yeah. Um, and hey, you start getting into specialized stuff like a uh, Damascus steel where you take a, uh, a bunch of different types of uh, metal, and you combine them all together to make a like a, it's called pattern welding. Okay. Uh, and you can see all the different uh, types of metals in the in the blade. Uh-huh. It's all like folded together. You know, it's sort of like a, uh, a samurai sword uh, okay. type of thing where they keep on folding and folding and folding and uh, forge welding. What's the advantage to having those layers of metal in there? Number one, the the beauty of it, you can have different pattern welds in the steel. Okay. Uh, number two, it, it can it, depending on how you heat the blade, uh, anneal it, temper it, and you can make a a, a really tough tough blade. You, know, you can use uh, different types of uh, steels in there. You can use one that's higher carbon, 
one that's higher in nickel, uh, chromium, and uh, just different compounds in, in the different steels. And you combine those uh, different properties all together, uh, you can get a really hard, hard edge with a flexible spine. Okay. So, you know, it has a less of a tendency to uh, snap or break or uh, hold an edge a whole lot better than just a, a single compound uh, metal. Okay. So, you know, that, that would be the advantage of that. That makes sense. Is there, did you find yourself having to learn some of the, like the, the science aspects that go into it? Was it the, or? Oh, I, I, absolutely. And I'm, I'm still very much a student. I'm nowhere near a, a master <laughs> you know, <laughs> yet. Um, it, it's all very much a, a learning process. You know, I'm, um, I have a lot of equipment now and, uh, you know, just from being on forest and fire, you know, um, uh, winning the episode, the I took the the prize money and used that to purchase a lot more uh, big equipment that I really needed. Okay. Uh, to to further, uh, you know, the the voice thing. Tell me about that TV show a little bit because I'm not familiar with it, but I did see it uh, mentioned on your oh, Facebook okay. group. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, pretty much like a, like a competition mm-hmm. where you have uh, four uh, bladesmiths uh, that come from all different backgrounds and different parts of the country. And, you know, they all come to the uh, studio um, trying to uh, make a better blade than, than the other. Okay. And uh, there's, there's uh, three judges. On the show, you have um, different challenges where they will uh, give you, let's say, a car. And you have to pull off of off a car or harvest off that car different types of metals that oh. you have to make a blade out of. Okay. And uh, so, you know, it's not just like, all right, uh, you, you, here's a piece of steel, make a blade. You uh-huh. know, it, you know the, the whole challenge is figuring out what type of metal has uh, enough carbon in it that you can make a hard blade with it. Right. So, um, you know, it's just a, it, that's a, a great, great challenge. And, you got to figure stuff out. So it's not, there's a lot more to the show than just making ways. You know, it's a, it's a competition. So you have to pace yourself. Um, you can't go really, really hard as we all know, to, just like in running. If you run real hard in the very beginning, you're going to be exhausted at the end. You have sure. to pace yourself. <laughs> so, you know, it's a three hour competition. And um, if you, move on to the next section, um, you know, the eliminate one for the first portion of the show. And if you move on, uh, then I'll scale if for the handle or make a, a hidden handle or whatever, whatever type of blade they ask you to make. Uh-huh. And out of those three, uh, two will move on, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the third person go. And uh, then you go back to your own home forge and they will give you a blade that you have to make out of uh, either steel that they provide to you, or you can have your own steel okay. and uh, make the knockers or, you know, whatever. And then uh, you bring it back to the studio and then they, uh, they put it through some pretty hard tests. Okay. If you're a blade can, you know, withstand to the, uh, the challenges or break or uh, go dull or, you know, what, what have you. And um, it's just, it's really, really exciting, you know, to see, you know, these high, highly qualified judges, uh, judging your blade and holding it and wielding it. And it's a, it's really cool. It's really exciting. That's neat. That's, <laughs> that sounds like a fun show. Uh, it's called Forged in Flame, right? Forged in Fire. Forged mm-hmm. in Fire. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll link uh, I'll link that up in yeah. the show notes there. That sounds pretty fun. And so, um, so you won. And you got the prize money. And and mm-hmm. so, what what did you buy with your prize money? How did you how did you upgrade with that? I um, purchased uh, I purchased a um, electric. Um, press it's a 24 ton press okay and a what's called a, a power hammer where the, uh, the, the hammer goes up and down really really hard and, and uh, beats the uh, the metal so you know, you're not just using your elbow and your arm and <laughs> your right. whole body uh, getting beaten up after a while <laughs> uh, you know you can you can use that a little bit and uh, really move the metal quickly, and uh, it, it really helps with the uh, Damascus seal and forging all of the uh, metals together. How much old, like old equipment versus like newfangled equipment, do you use? Is there is there like you know new uh, new advances being made in bladesmithing technology, or is it really just kind of sticking to an older process? Well, uh, yeah, there's there's some um, a, a lot of bladesmithing is uh, pretty much 
it really hasn't changed that much. Uh, you know, some of the elements that are in the the steels, you know, they they have uh, changed uh-huh. where uh, you know they refine the steel, but they they've actually taken blades from a thousand years ago, fifteen hundred years ago, and given it to a a, um, a foundry, and they'll analyze it, seeing what type of elements are in there and uh, what kind of compounds, and see if there's slag and you know different. Um, Elements that really would make the blade weak, and they are just now uh, making steel as refined as some of these steels from 1500 years ago. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. So it's just uh, it's truly, truly amazing how the uh, blades really were um, uh, 1500 years ago. And, you know, some of those techniques have really been lost, and we're um, just trying to keep it alive. You know, because. Uh, for a while there, blacksmithing was a dying art, but it, it, it was not a very celebrated art. You know, it's, right. a, it's one of those arts that uh, takes a lot of fortitude, of a lot of strength. Uh, you're gonna, it, you're in a very hot environment, uh-huh. and uh, you know, sparks are flying all over the place, and it's, it's not one that you're uh, prone to sitting on a couch watching TV. You know, right. You're out there <laughs> really and beating yourself up. And, uh, but the uh, the reward for blacksmithing is uh, being able to stand back and look at something that you created uh, that has taken on a life of its own. You know, you've taken uh, a square piece of, or just a blank piece of steel, and uh-huh. you've turned it into uh, a blade that has a soul now, you know, because a part of you is in that blade. It's one of those art forms that it looks very dramatic when you're watching it being done because you're seeing the hammer and you're seeing the, the glowing steel and the guy whacking away on it and, and you go, ah, that's, mm-hmm. that's really dramatic looking. And then when somebody goes, you want to try it? You're like, no, no, I don't, I don't want to try it. <laughs> it looks, it looks horrendously difficult and uncomfortable. Um, so was it, I mean, when you, when you got into it, you said you had a, a, a an interest in blades and things like that, but mm-hmm. not, you hadn't really done that before. So what was it about, actually making the blades that and the, and that process and that type of thing that, uh, that drew you into it and kept you doing it after that first one. Well, before I was a cop, I owned a uh, landscape and tree company. And, and okay. again, through the, uh, through necessity of learning how to fix equipment and weld and, uh, bend metal and, you know, heat things up and shape them. Uh-huh. So I had a, a basic understanding you know, of how a metal worked and welded together and what, what worked and what didn't work. Okay. But what really drew me, what really drew me into the blades, was how you could just take something that was oh, like really, like soft and pliable, and through putting it in the fire and treating it with oil and and then heating it back up again, you could turn it into something really, really hard uh, that would uh, you could pull it in one direction and bend it like a spring and it would snap back into its original shape. Uh-huh. And that's just, to me, that's just like magic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just uh, how you can make something or change something uh, chemically and uh, through changing all the atoms and relining all the atoms. It's just, it is just mind boggling to me anyway. Um, you know, it's just, it's neat to watch something change right before your eyes. Yeah. And, you know, it's just that you're creating something and you're giving life to something. And, um, you know, for, for so many years, you probably saw uh, so much life being taken before you, uh-huh. and now you're creating something. It's like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's almost like alchemy. It's uh, pretty interesting that way. Yes, yes, exactly. It's like being a wizard. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you need you just need the big Merlin hat, and you'll be all set. That's and, it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of uh, I mean, what kind of uh, space? What kind of workshop do you have that you work out of? Living on a farm, you, you have a access. To, uh, we have access to a barn. Okay. We have a, a three a three thousand square foot barn, and probably about three quarters of it is the forge now. Oh, okay. So you know, it's just it's really expanded, and um, you know, making a lot of blades and a lot of orders, and um, it's just for me. Uh, that, um, I have a couple of students too, and uh, teaching them. Neat. And uh, just pass and just passing the the art on, and just watching. It, watching their faces, their enthusiasm, their excitement of making blades just keeps me going that much more. Uh-huh. And uh, being able to pass something on like that is just really, really cool. Yeah, that's great. And it's it's one of those 
uh, skills that's always in danger of going away because of modern technology and, and, and equipment oh, and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it only takes one generation to lose everything. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So you have – I was looking at your Facebook page, and you make a wide variety of different blades and things. How do you decide going into a project what kind of blade you want to make? Uh, one is uh, what does a client want. Uh-huh. And that, that usually dictates, you know, what I'm going to make. But if it's up to me, um, I just let, I'll just start forging something and I let the metal tell me what it wants to become. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, there, there's not a whole lot of, um, I, I, I have a general idea of what I want to make uh-huh. and it just happens, you know, and, um, uh, it just, it all depends on how it feels in the hand. Okay. You know, as I'm forging it, um, uh, does it feel good? Does it bounce well? You know, sometimes I have like, well, I'm going to make a, a very specific sword. And, all right, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. But I'll just start beating on a piece of metal and just watch it form and let it go where it wants to go. <laughs> now, that's interesting. Cause yeah, I think every art form has its, its version of doodling. Um, as a musician and yeah. a comedian myself, I have those, those forms of, of just doodling until something arrives, but I had no idea that you could do that with a hunk of metal and some fire. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, and, um, talking to a lot of, uh, master blades in this, it, and it's just, to me, I think it's so true. And uh, just about all professions and, and artisans is that the difference between a, uh, a novice and a master is that a master will take a mistake and turn it into something that's perfect. Sure. Uh-huh. And, and they'll just keep on working at it, working at it, working at it until it becomes something, um, something beautiful. And, uh, or as a novice may just give it up and say, no, nah, that's not right. And just throw it to the side and, you know, it's some, it's somewhere in that hunk of metal is a beautiful blade. Ah, okay. To me, I think that's the only difference between, a, you know, a master and a novice. It's just, you know, the persistence. Yeah. And um, and it, you need a lot of persistence, and sometimes you get pretty frustrated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that that totally makes sense uh, from an artistic point of view. I've had songs, and not to call myself a master by any means, but I've had songs that began from a mistake and then turned into really successful songs. So that uh, that. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Um, but the idea of, of doing that with, um, like I said, just with a hunk of metal and some fire just is, is mind-blowing to me. So what kind of um, commissions do you get? Is there is there like a most popular kind of item that you get uh, requests for? Uh, no, I don't think there's any like one particular blade that is, you know, that, that more popular. Um, I do a lot of cutlasses okay uh just because you know i'm in that environment a lot and you know people want to use it in in live um uh, sword fighting okay where you know it, it won't have an edge it's called uh stage ready you uh-huh. know so in case someone slips and hits your wrist or arm or something like that you're not gonna remove something that right. is intended to stay there <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I make a lot of uh, uh short uh, sharp uh, swords and um knives and uh, K bars and Bell Dukes and Pickeries and you know just a, a, a wide variety and okay. I, I don't I don't really so much uh, like just concentrating on just one because if you uh, concentrate just on one it, you tend to lose that like ability to make a whole variety of different things sure. and um, you know just concentrating just solely on one. Yeah. And uh, I think that to me, I think that's more of a challenge uh, being able to keep the variety in there and of the different knives, you know, the, the, like a sax, you know, people, people look at a, a sax blade, you know, like a Viking sax. Uh-huh. Oh, that's a really simple, a really simple blade to make. Well, yeah. And in the shape of it, yes, but it, it's actually pretty complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, getting a, the correct angle and uh, geometry on it, and uh, making sure it cuts properly, where you have the whole uh, edge of the blade coming down, right down to the edge, uh-huh. and uh, the cutting edge, and there's no secondary edge to uh, make on the blade. So it's it, it takes a little bit to to get to that. And, Certainly. Um, have you had anybody come to you yet where they go, "I want uh, this kind of thing," and you go, "I don't even, I have no idea what that is." Oh yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I've, I've, had, I've had people come up to me with a napkin <laughs> and a crayon. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I want this. Um, okay, well, what is it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, they, well, just use your imagination. Just come up with whatever you think is good. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, it's, um, not, not to like actually I've caught myself on the back, but 99% of the time they're like, oh wait, oh, we it's exactly what I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, good. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, because it's kind of a challenge trying to figure out where are they trying to go with this? You know, sure. it's, uh, it's, you know, is this exactly what they want? And it's like, ah, I don't know, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I imagine there's probably just some, some physics problems involved in some designs that an amateur would oh bring you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I, I just have people give me like a corkscrew <laughs> a looking thing with a, with a, a secondary blade on the outside going up like a roller coaster. I'm like, oh, it, it just, it won't work. <laughs> so I'm like, I said, I tried to explain to them that you have to, Eh, it'd be a little, a little less subtle than than that, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, then I'll make the blade, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, that's even cooler than what I thought uh, you were going to make." <laughs> right? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, this one works. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and um, it's 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 pretty cool. It's, you know, the the best thing to me is, or, or the the biggest reward is uh, from blade smithing is making and creating something, and then giving it to the client, uh-huh. and then watch the client's face. Just like lay it up, like oh my gosh, you made this for me. It's just like yeah, <laughs> you know, you see that that excitement and that that uh, enthusiasm for the blade. It's just like oh man, that's so cool. That's neat. <laughs> that's really great, it man. Is. So where is the uh, where's the best place for people to keep up with what you're doing and and order something from you if they'd like to? Um, I have a, a Facebook page, uh, BD Blades. Okay, and um, you know that's. Uh, that's pretty much why I, I contact everybody, and uh, you know, they can look at the uh, different things that I've made up and get ideas from that. And, and uh, you know, I can uh, message them back and forth on, on uh, uh, Facebook, and you know, can talk about the blade, the size of the blade, you know, what uh, weight do you want, uh, what type of felt, and, and guard, and you know, it's just uh, I, I try to give the client what they want. Sure. Yeah, you know, I don't try to um, direct. In, in a different direction other than what they want and, and I'll, I'll make suggestions like, uh-huh. well, I don't think that'll work <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good so I will I'll make sure to link up the uh, your Facebook uh, page on the uh, show notes and all that kind of stuff so people can find you online and uh, I appreciate you coming on the show this has been really fun good good I love, uh, thanks for uh, giving me a call I you betcha alright man we'll talk again soon All right, take care. All righty, bye-bye. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with B.D. McGee of B.D. Blades. And you can find B.D. Blades on Facebook. And it's a group rather than a page, so the easiest way is to go to Facebook, put B.D. Blades in the search box, and it'll pop right up. Uh, Easy to find that way. And I will also link it in the show notes at underthecrossbones.com slash 099. We have got a new sponsor on the show today. Look, as a musician myself... I can tell you that one of the hardest things to find is a really good teacher for the low-frequency instruments, your bass, your tuba, that kind of stuff, right? But if you are in the realm of Houston, Texas, I have a suggestion for you. Jonathan Leon, who is a longtime listener to Under the Crossbones, he's starting a new lesson studio to teach electric and upright bass, tuba, and piano, and his studio is called Making Great Music. Why? Because that's what you're going to do when you come out of it. And he's got the chops. He's been a musician for 25 years. He's played in the pit for 19 musicals. He studied with the amazing Victor Wooten. If you don't know that name, go Google it. And uh, you need some bass in your life. You simply do. And some tuba. Who doesn't want to learn how to play the tuba, man? Tuba is an awesome instrument. Brat. Adults and kids are welcome. And Jonathan's a fellow pirate, so we're keeping it in the family, man. To get more info and to set up some time with Jonathan, go to underthecrossbones.com slash making great music. Again, that's underthecrossbones.com slash making great music. 
We're also sponsored today, of course, by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC-DB, playing the best music in Pirate Radio Talk. You can listen to this show on both stations. Just go to PirateRadioTheTreasureCoast.com or PirateRadioTC.com, and don't forget to download their apps. That's the Pirate Radio Treasure Coast app, which is the music station, and the Pirate Radio Talk, which is the talk station. And again, you can listen under the crossbones on both them stations. And uh, I know I have a lot of listeners uh, on uh, on Pirate Radio, the Treasure Coast. So I appreciate you tuning in. Wonderful to see you. Uh, you guys are all over the world, so that's fantastic. Oh, you know what? I forgot to tell you about one other uh, tour date that I just booked, November 3rd and 4th. I know it's a way out. I will be headlining in Orlando, Florida, and I know there are uh, at least a few thousand of you listening in Orlando, Florida. So uh, this is a little bit of an experiment on my part to see if I come to a town that I have not played before or at least haven't in many, many years, uh, if you guys will come out and see me. So I would like you to go mark that on your calendar right now, November 3rd and 4th. I'll be doing one show each night at uh, the Bonkers Comedy Club, which is at Boardwalk Bowl in Orlando, Florida. So we'll talk more about that later. I'm also booking more tour dates around that area. If you perchance want to do a house concert or something, you're in that area. Hit me up. We'll get it all set up. All right, cool. Uh, I also have a free ebook for you. It's Alexander Squemlin's Pirates of Panama or Buccaneers of America. And this is a seminal piece of pirate writing, originally published in 1678 by Alexander Squemlin, who was a doctor who ended up on pirate ships and wrote about his adventures and his experiences on those ships. So it's uh, like a first-person account, pirate, shippy, a golden agey kind of stuff. So it's really great. And I got a free copy of it for you. All you have to do is go to underthecrossbones.com, click on the free ebook button, and you can download it right there. Or if you're out and about, all you have to do is uh, pick up your cell phone. It's probably in your hand anyway, or it's very nearby, right? Maybe in your pocket giving you uh, testicular cancer. Just take your phone and text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Okay, that's our show for today, kids. Thank you once again for tuning in. If you want to find out more about BD McGee and BD Blades, go to Facebook and put BD Blades in the search box, and or you can come to the show notes at underthecrossbones.com slash 099, and I will have a link to all the good stuff there, as uh, well as a bunch of other fun things and notes on the show and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, make sure you're subscribed to the show uh, at your preferred uh, podcatcher of choice. And uh, I hope you're having a good time. I hope you're having a nice week. I hope you're having a nice summer. Stay cool. Uh, Stay frothy. I don't know what that means. And I'll see you next week. Bye.